ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Art Carton. Thank you very much. I am honored by the invitation. I have enjoyed working with the Leadership Institute uh, through IHS to do the videos like the one that you uh, like the one that you just saw. They're making an impact. Um, when I went to have my taxes done in Memphis in March, the secretary at the at, at the uh, at my accountant's office kind of looked down, then looked up, and, and said, "Learn Liberty." Okay. She had recognized me from a video. I think like the, like, you know, like this one that someone had put on had put on Facebook. So the Leadership Institute and IHS are combining to really make a difference. I think in terms of public rhetoric about economics. So you might wonder what is the what was the economics on one foot shtick? Um, someone once once asked Ayn Rand if she could summarize her entire philosophy while standing on one foot, which she proceeded to do. Uh, I'm told that there's, so histor historically, one rabbi asked another, can you summarize the entire Torah while standing on one foot? And so apparently that's where, that's where this comes from. And when we talk about economics, the fundamentals can be summarized on one foot. The really, really, uh, the details require journal articles and books and things like that. But when we keep our eye on the ball, when we recognize that people respond to incentives, when we recognize that resources are scarce and that there is no such thing as a free lunch, we can get a lot of analytical power. We can gain a lot of insight. And all this comes from a handful of basic propositions. So I want to talk about a couple of different things uh, this morning in the time that I have. First, I just want to discuss briefly where we've been, where we are, where we're going. I want to talk about a big mistake that people make in looking at economic policy by focusing on distribution rather than growth. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some pro-growth policy ideas. I'll speak about the institutional conditions for growth, and then I'll conclude and ask for you know, any questions that you all have. So <clears throat> the major thing is, uh, one, one, of the, one of the major things that keeps me optimistic is to look at the past and to spend a lot of time looking at the past. I'm trained as an economic historian, and the economist James Buchanan once said that you know, when, he, when he looks forward, he is extremely pessimistic. But when he looks backward, he's really, really optimistic. And I, too, am optimistic when I look at the past, particularly when I look at deep history, because the normal state of humankind for almost all of our existence has been zero economic growth and zero freedom. Even in the great societies of antiquity, you know, we had some wonderful ideas that flowered up from, uh, yeah, fr from uh, the classical world of Greece and Rome. But even still, most people were slaves. Even still, we had basically no economic growth whatsoever. Life expectancy at the height of the Roman Empire was, if I, if I remember correctly, 24. Okay? Today, I fully expect all three of my children to live to see at least 70, 80, 90, 100. Okay? We have incredible, incredible opportunities that we've not had historically. About 250 to 300 years ago, something really, really, really serious changed. Something really serious changed that gave us modern economic growth. Historically, we've had basically no growth and no liberty. In the last two and a half or three centuries, we've gotten two unique human experiences. One, economic growth. Two, liberty. The obvious and simple system of natural liberty, to borrow a phrase from Adam Smith, which then produces this modern economic growth, created an experience for humankind that has been completely and totally different. It's a, it, it, it's a complete break from almost anything that people have ever experienced. So looking forward, I understand that there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ways that things could be better, but there are also lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ways that things could be worth, worse. Going, for, uh, going forward, I see lots and lots of economic growth. We're going to continue to get richer. We're going to continue to, my children's standards, standard of living will be much higher than mine. However, as a result of some of the policy mistakes that we're making right now, my children's standards of living will not be what they could be. Okay. And that, I think, is, is the result of, of a serious mistake that we make in looking at economic policy and in looking at economic growth, and that is in focusing on distribution. The economist Robert Lucas, uh, a Nobel laureate, has said a couple of really, really interesting things about economic growth. First of all, he said, you know, we make it, we make it, when you start thinking about economic growth, it's almost impossible to think about anything else. When you think about what economic growth gets us over a period of a decade or two decades or three decades or five decades or ten decades, it's really hard to think about anything else. It's true that there's a lot more to life 
than material wealth. Believe me, I know, I understand. However, as the economist Deidre McCluskey has put it, an impoverished mass of juveniles makes for easy tyranny. Okay? So in a world where we have lots of poverty, where life is, is literally nasty, brutish, and short, we attenuate the social, cultural, political, and economic institutions that make for flourishing of liberty, that make for flourishing of the kinds of things that we associate with a very, very, very good life. So Lucas said, once we start thinking about economic growth, it's really hard to think about anything else. And he says that we make a serious mistake when we focus on distribution rather than growth. Why? Because if, if you look at the forces that have done the most to alleviate genuine poverty, to alleviate genuine human suffering in the world, it's been economic growth. It has not been redistribution. Redistribution does not solve the problem of poverty. Redistribution might change the mode of distribution of income at one point in time, but it's going to continue changing forward. And often, when people pursue a policy of redistribution, they don't recognize the fact that people respond to incentives and that when you, create, when you create incentives for people to seek redistributions, you get ultimately lower economic growth. So um, one of the major conclusions of economic policy, or excuse me, one of the major conclusions of careful, well-done economic analysis, which I discuss in the video, is the law of unintended consequences. And one of the sad realities of the modern world is that the unintended consequences of a lot of policies that get adopted are to actually make worse off the people that we think we're trying to help through things like income redistribution, through things like minimum wages, through things like international trade restrictions, through things like price controls. Joseph Schumpeter referred to uh, what he called the capitalist achievement as um, not creating more silk stockings for the Queen of England. Rather, it was creating newer, better silk stockings available, or newer, better stockings and hosiery for factory girls for ever progressively lower levels of effort. Okay. That's something that I think is really important. When we look at economic history over the last couple of centuries, it is true that there are some people who are very, very rich. There are some people who are very, very poor. But our definition of poverty in the United States especially, and in the West more generally, is almost laughable considered in historical perspective. This isn't to say that it's not hard to be poor in the United States. This certainly isn't to say that there isn't genuine suffering in some parts of the world, but we, we really need to recognize just how good we have it. And if poverty is going to have if, if poverty is going to have a real meaning, if poverty is going to if poverty is going to have a real meaning, we have to expand our horizons and we have to look beyond the borders of the United States. We have to look beyond where we are right now and look historically and say, well, look, poverty meant something very, very different. 300 years ago than poverty means right now. Who have been the big winners of the modern age? The biggest winners of the modern age have been not necessarily the rich, have not necessarily been the kings and queens, have not necessarily been the people of privilege. Rather, the big winners from modern, liberal, European, American, Western capitalism have been the poor. Why? Because how do people get rich? How did Sam Walton get rich. One of the phenomena that I study is Walmart. I study the, the effects of Walmart on pretty much everything. How did Sam Walton get rich? Sam Walton did not get rich by providing newer, better baubles and trinkets for the richest of the richest of the richest of the rich. Rather, Sam Walton got rich by providing high, well, reasonable quality goods, <laughs> reasonable quality goods at rock bottom prices for people of very, very, very modest means. In short, the Walton family built one of the greatest fortunes that the modern world can observe today, not by conquest, not by empire, not even, again, by providing you know, better luxury cars for very, very rich people. The Waltons got rich by providing decent clothes for people of very, very, very modest means. And the effect has been astronomical. The effect has been astronomical. In a book that was published in 2006, Richard Vetter and Wendell Cox estimated that the, they did a back of the envelope calculation and estimated that the effect of big box retailers like Walmart, Costco, Target, Sam's Club, Lowe's, Home Depot, et cetera, in the 20th century was roughly equal to the effect of the railroads on the American economy in the 19th century. I offer this as an example of what a focus on growth can get us and what right thinking 
about economics, economic policy, and economic reality can show us. The way to get rich, the way to get rich in the United States, the way to fulfill the American dream, and this is unique historically, this is unique historically, the way to, f to, the way to fulfill the American dream was not to get a job with the state, it was not to become a ruler or an emperor or a king or something like that. It was to come up with a better way to distribute cheap goods and services to poor people. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. And considering the broad sweep of history, I think we need to focus more on what Deidre McCluskey uh, calls the bourgeois deal. McCluskey, in a series of books, is discussing what she calls the bourgeois era which is again roughly the last 250, the last 300 years, where we saw this radical change. A radical change both in the political institutions and in the cultural rhetoric. So the institutions are fairly straightforward. Secure private property rights, a dependable legal system, open and competitive markets that created a world in which the way to, ri the, the way to get rich was not by picking other people's pockets, but rather by filling other people's pockets. I think that's a very, very, very important insight. Walmart, Target, companies like that, I think are emblematic of a way of doing things that is fundamentally unique. A way of doing things that for the most part was not part of the human experience for, uh, up until again, like I said, about 250 or 300 years ago, and a way of doing things that we might actually sacrifice if we're not careful. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about some pro-growth policy. So we'll get so we'll get we'll get um, on the ground and think specifically about what we can what we can do to get more economic growth over the course of the next several decades. Specific policy things. Then we'll step back a little bit and look at the broader institutional conditions, the broader rhetorical conditions for growth, and think about what we can do right now. So, for example, if you work for a congressman or a senator, what piece of legislation do you want to do you want to write after you get finished this morning? And uh, then looking back, what essay do you want to write for a scholarly journal um, going forward when we, think about the, when we think about the broad institutional conditions for growth? Okay, so first of all, in the, Uni in the United States, one thing that we, that we really should be looking at is a way to make it easier to move here. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people who want to become Americans, and we're preventing them from doing so for reasons that are really not that good. Okay, so one thing, that, one thing that we might want to think about to improve, Amer to improve American economic growth is to make it easier for people to immigrate. And not just people of high skill, but rather people of all skill levels. Why? When you look at the global skill distribution, immigrants tend to either come from the very, 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 very top, uh, engineers trained at the Indian Institute of Technology, or from the very, 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 very bottom. Americans, for the most part, are in the middle of the global skill distribution. This means that the skills immigrants bring to the table, high skills and low skills, are complements to, rather than substitutes for, American skills. Now then, you might have seen the South Park episode in which, the, in which immigrants from the future come and take the jobs away from modern, present-day Americans. That's, the real, or that's what a lot of people fear, but that's not the reality of immigration. That's not the reality of the global skill distribution. They're not going to come and take our jobs. Rather, they're going to come and do jobs that would not exist if they weren't here to do them, and in the process, make us wealthier. The economist Lant Pritchett uh, published a book several years ago called Let Their People Come on the economics of global immigration. And he points out that, if, 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 I, remember the number, if I remember the numbers correctly, we, uh, rich countries are spending something like $17 billion per year preventing immigration. But if we had an increase, if we had immigration equal to about a 3% increase in the labor force in existing wealthy countries, that would, be, that would result in a $300 billion increase in wealth for the poorest people in the world, and a $50 billion per year, I believe, increase in income and well-being for, for the relatively rich. Okay. So the idea that immigrants are going to come and take our jobs and lower our standards of living is not founded in fact necessarily, and indeed, wh when you look at the history, when you look at the intellectual history of immigration restrictions, we have things like minimum wages in the United States, and these were supported by economists to our great shame, in part, for, in part because they shut immigrants, African Americans, women, and children out of the labor market. 
the economist Thomas Leonard has looked at the intellectual history of restrictions on immigration, uh, workplace safety regulations, minimum wages, and things like that. And often we say, well, these were well intended, they just don't work. In fact, as Leonard points out, the consequences, unemployment, for example, uh, less innovation, less entrepreneurship, a less fluid labor market, were in fact the intended consequences of some of these rules and laws that were passed during the progressive era. I think we need to take a serious look at these and ask whether they, whether they in fact pass muster as matters, uh, as matters of economic policy. A second thing is free trade. If you scratch any economist in the world, and every economist in the world is a, is, is a committed free trader, a lot of times people will look and say, well, we can't trade with China, or Walmart is Wal Walmart's a terrible organization because they buy so much stuff from China, or we can't trade with China because once again, it will, they'll take our jobs, or something to that effect. Here's a very specific example. Um, there's an article in the Daily Caller recently called a, a conservative case for sugar tariffs, to uh, which I responded because there is, there's no case for sugar tariffs, conservative, liberal, libertarian, otherwise, that is consistent with basic economics. Okay. Now, it's easy to focus on what is seen, the additional sugar jobs in Florida or something like that as a result of the tariff, but it's harder to see the jobs, the opportunities, the employment that does not exist as a result of sugar protectionism. The reason I mentioned the article is because it talked about Brazil, referred to Brazil as the OPEC of sugar, and indeed Brazil's a major sugar exporter. I was in Brazil over the weekend, you know, giving some lectures on economics to a group of excellent, wonderful, fantastic students who make me incredibly optimistic about the future of liberty. One thing I noticed coming back is, or on my way there and on my way back, is there are a lot of people who are on their way to or from Disney World. A lot of people who are to or from Disney World. Where do they get the money to go to Disney World? Where do they get the dollars to go to Disney World? Where do they get the dollars to create the opportunities for people who work at Disney World, for people who work for Disney very generally? They get those dollars by selling us stuff. They get those dollars by selling us stuff. So it looks like we're benefiting American workers by prohibiting or by making, uh, by making sugar from Brazil more uh, artificially expensive relative to what it would be on the world market. In fact, the people who are really losing from this are those who would otherwise have jobs at Disney World, who would otherwise have jobs working as Imagineers, who would otherwise have jobs working in, say, the American tourism sector, who aren't able to because we're preventing Brazilians from earning the dollars that they would then spend on these goods in the United States. So a tax on imports, a tariff on imports, is actually also a tariff on exports. We're not punishing foreigners. Rather, we're punishing Americans, American consumers, first of all, and, Americans, uh, and American producers of goods and services that could be sold abroad. Now, so, th so those, are, those, are two, those are two specifics. Free trade in labor globally, free trade in goods and services globally. Now then, I wanna, I wanna think, uh, sort of step back go up to about the 50,000 foot view and consider some of the institutional conditions for growth and what we should be thinking about going forward about how we can, how we can actualize some of these institutional conditions and really change policy, change people's mindsets and uh, really be faithful to the free market vision. The first is secure private property rights. Secure private property rights are necessary and essential economic growth. If you don't have secure property rights to your stuff, to your land, to your person, to your house, to your whatever, then you have diminished incentives to invest, diminished incentives to develop the value of your assets, diminished incentives to create assets very generally. One of the most secure rights you can have is the right to the income that you earn. We know that people respond to incentives and when you tax people heavily when you spend enormous amounts of money, when you create what's going to be an obvious gigantic tax burden for future generations, you reduce people's incentive to earn, uh, to earn income, therefore you, make the entire, therefore you make the entire world poorer. When you redistribute resources, when you redistribute land from private owners to governments, and then in turn to other private owners, you're destabilizing the structure of private property rights, you're lowering economic growth over the long run, and you're in part responsible for the United States slipping from near the top of the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom of the World Index to number 18 
in that very same index. A second thing is a dependable legal system. A dependable, a dependable legal system is not something that can be centrally planned. Rather, it's something that emerges. So we want to think hard about how people react to the incentives that are, to the incentives that are created by legal institutions. Okay, we want to think hard about whether we can, in fact, decide this is legal, this is illegal, that should be legal, that should be illegal, this should be regulated, 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 and that should be regulated. With the regulations being enforced by judges who may not necessarily have a whole lot of skin in the game. Okay. So a dependable legal system, a dependable regulatory environment, well, okay, a dependable regulatory environment might be a bit of an oxymoron. But rather, um, <coughs> what, we, what, we, uh, what, we, what we want to think about is how the incentives change based on laws that are being passed and the, and, and, the, and the fact that so many business decisions are taken out of the hands of the contracting parties and ultimately put in the hands of judges. Finally, and this, this, uh, this, uh, this I think is a big one. This is, a, this is an opportunity both for intellectuals and an opportunity for activists. Um, one of the most essential elements of modern American or modern Western prosperity very generally is open and competitive markets. People being able to buy and sell goods and services in open and competitive markets. The Institute for Justice last year released a report on occupational licensing that quite honestly scares me a little bit. There's not a whole lot that really scares me about economic policy going forward, but they argue that one in three American workers now need a license from the government to engage in their chosen profession. If you want to arrange flowers in Louisiana, you need a license from the government. Okay? This is antithetical to the spirit of free market competition. It is antithetical to the spirit of innovation. It is antithetical to the bourgeois deal that's helped to make us so rich and that has helped to create so many great and wonderful opportunities for so many people. So thinking very specifically, we want to ask, well, how did this take place? How did this take place? Do we, in fact, actually need occupational licensing? Some might argue that we do in order to ensure quality. However, um, as the economist Morris Kleiner has estimated, we don't actually get more quality as a result of occupational licensing. We just get restrictions on competition. We get less open, less dynamic, less competitive, therefore less innovative markets than we, than we would otherwise get. Recent years have seen the emergence of a radical movement called Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street, Occupy this, Occupy that, Occupy Memphis. I'd like to propose that we occupy the rent-seeking society. The rent-seeking society is one in which people seek to get wealthy not by innovating, not by creating new stuff, not by doing what Sam Walton did and finding newer, better ways to get reasonable quality merchandise in the hands of poor people, but rather the rent-seeking society is a society in which people get rich by directly picking other people's pockets or by using the government to prevent other people from competing with them. I think there are a couple of different things that we, a couple of different things that we, that we can do here. First, you, you, we, like I said, we can look hard at what occupational licensing, what restrictions, what regulations we have, what purposes they serve, and what effects they ultimately have on markets for goods, services, labor, and capital. A second thing that I think would be very, very interesting, and this is something I might, I might do myself, would be to actually attend a board meeting of an organization, of, of sort of like a local licensing board in, say, Birmingham, Alabama, or the state of Alabama very generally, or Virginia, and ask the hard questions. Say, you know, why do you have to have a license to arrange flowers in Louisiana? Why do you have to have a license to be an athletic trainer in Alabama? Why do you have to have a license to do this? Not, not why do you have to be certified, not why do you, not do you offer some sort, of, uh, some sort of information about the quality of the goods, but why are you saying thou shalt not engage in this occupation unless you have a license for unless you have a license from the government. I think fundamentally um, we need to think hard about a number of different things. First, where we've come from, the no growth, no liberty world. Where we are, a growth plus liberty world that was that is historically unique and that happened as a result of a lot of very, very, very important things that were not accidents. A lot of important intellectual in, uh, innovations, primarily in the 18th century. 
And I want to think about, I think we should think hard about where we're going. Should we be focused as a country, as a society, on questions of distribution or growth? Given that we should be focused on questions of growth, we should be asking what policies ultimately lead to growth? How can we recapture secure private property rights? How can we recapture a dependable legal system and regulatory environment? How can we recapture open and competitive markets going forward? So I am happy to answer any questions that people have. Okay. Oh. Being an economic historian, mm -hmm. uh, you reminded me of a, of a story that supports your points this morning. 175 years ago, the railroad approached the city fathers of Decatur, Georgia, mm -hmm. and said, we'd like to make Decatur our terminus. The city fathers met and said, no, we don't want the noise, congestion, pollution, crime, mm -hmm. population density, et cetera. So the railroad went to a tiny little suburb of Decatur, a little town called Marthasville. And the city fathers of Marthasville said, yes, we would like the growth, the prosperity, the jobs, the money. And Marthasville grew and prospered and changed its name to Atlanta. Yeah, that's a very, that's, that's a very, very important point. I've heard, I've heard a similar story, so, so the, the history of Atlanta, um, that uh, a railroad said they, they wanted to make their southern terminus Decatur, Georgia, and Atlanta, the city that became Atlanta ultimately said, yeah, we'll take that. I've heard a similar story about Delta Airlines, um, that they came to Birmingham, Alabama, and said, hey, we want Birmingham to be our, our, uh, uh, our hub. And Birmingham is, I, I've, heard, I've heard different versions of this story, the, and all, all the versions I've heard are before, before Google, and... I've been, I've been too lazy to actually Google and verify which story is correct, but apparently the city fathers in Birmingham said, okay, great, we're going to tax jet fuel at a penny a gallon. And Delta said, okay, no, uh, we're going to go talk to Atlanta. Okay. So opening, um, th th this raises a number of very, very interesting points here about things like, you know, things like pollution, because that, that's, that's, a, that's a genuine and serious problem. Uh, unfortunately, given that we, we, only have a few, we have only, only have a few minutes left, we can't really go into huge, deep detail about dealing with problems of pollution. I'll punt this to Ronald Coase's article, The Problem of Social Cost, which is the most cited article in the law, and I think also the most cited article in all of economics. And then Murray Rothbard has a great article that was published in the Cato Journal in the early 1980s called Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution that talks about how legal institutions can deal with stuff like this. One thing, one thing that's, one thing that's that, that, that this, that this, that this raises is an idea that, that troubles me a little bit about how people think that, that they have a right to veto other people's decisions because it might make them uncomfortable. Okay, so for example, if, if, if my neighbor wants to paint his or her house shock pink, okay, well, maybe I won't like it, but it's not my house, okay? If I wanted to be able to exercise veto power over my neighbor's decisions, there are homeowners associations and things like that that I could have joined. The neighborhoods I've lived in have been areas where we haven't had these kinds of restrictions, and we've had lots and lots and lots of flourishing, cool stuff that our neighbors have done to their houses, have done to their yards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in, in the case of things like railroad development and things of that nature, the sticky regulatory problem comes again from the fact that everybody wants to be a veto player. We want to be able to say, well, look, I, this is going to look ugly. It's going to compromise my view or something like that. Therefore, I should be allowed to stop the progress that, um, that everybody else would enjoy just because I don't like it or, it make, or because I, I think it's icky or something, or something to that effect. I think that's, that's, a, that's an attitude that I think is, is unfortunately um, antithetical to long-run economic growth. Because one, one, of the thing, one of the things that it resembles is, say, a world in which somebody might say, uh, well, okay, I, I really don't want a new retail establishment to open up because I like the place that I patronize and I like earning my economic profits. I should be allowed to veto other people. I read an interesting story in one of the textbooks I teach from yesterday about Honda. And apparently Japan's, uh, Japan's Ministry of, uh, Ministry of 
oh goodness, I'm, I'm, I forget, MITI, M-I-T-I. Uh, I forget exactly what the, what the acronym stands for. Basically, their industrial policy board uh, tried to prevent Honda from making cars. You know, Honda was a motorcycle company, and they said, yeah, we don't need, yeah, we don't need you to make cars. You shouldn't be making cars. Okay, well, it's pretty obvious how well that worked out. Okay, so um, I, th I, think, I think we need to, we need to be open to uh, other people's innovations. We need to let other people have the liberty to eat our lunch if necessary, and sometimes perhaps leave us uncomfortable. So I'm going to assume you all are moderating here. You talked a little bit about uh, distribution mm -hmm. and about uh, how Walmart was successful yeah. in um, w targeting the poor for their profits. Um, in can you discuss a little bit about the uh, number of jobs in America, particularly government jobs, that are dependent on a large, poorly functioning lower class, and does this create a uh, conflict of interest as well as a political problem? Okay. Yeah, so, so gover government, jobs depend, government jobs that depend on a large body of poor people. Um, okay, so I don't, I don't know the exact number. Um, I think it does, crea it does create a conflict of interest because uh, it's been said that there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. And further, when, we, when, we, when, when people step in and say, we're going to help the poor, well, there, there's going to be all sorts of mission creep. People are not necessarily going to have incentives to solve the problems because once the problem's solved, so, so if, if I'm, if I'm you know, chairman of the Department of Poor People or something like that, and I solve the problem, all of a sudden I'm out of a job. Okay? So my incentive to actually solve the problem will be somewhat diminished. Further, I'm going to have an incentive to go out and find all sorts of new problems that my department should uh, should be should be sticking it should be sticking its hands in. Um, this is a huge problem in not just not just domestic poverty alleviation, but also international poverty alleviation, and indeed like foreign missions and things like that. Two of the best books I've read in the last couple of years are uh, one is called When Helping Hurts by Steve Corbett and Brian Fickert. Another is called Toxic Charity by a guy named Robert Lupton. And it talks about sort of within the context of American, uh, of American benevolence, and in particular American benevolence abroad, um, this development of, an al of almost an industry of compassion that doesn't work. Okay. So um, I would be, I, I, I haven't, so I haven't studied specifically the relationship between, between government employment and the creation of a lar and creation of a large lower class, but the incentives are definitely there. Yeah, hi. Uh, in the um, early part of the Obama administration, uh, first few months, I forgot exactly when. Uh, Rush Limbaugh uh, famously said that he hoped that uh, the president fails. Mm -hmm. And uh, I listened over several weeks as he des described why he hoped the president failed. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, columnists, even conservative columnists, incorrectly said that Rush Limbaugh said that he hopes America fails. Mm -hmm. And if you had heard what Mr. Limbaugh said, he basically said that he already knows that those policies that the Obama administration was proposing would fail, mm -hmm. would, would hurt the United States. Yeah. Therefore, he hoped that those policies would fail so that the United States would succeed. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I uh, premise my question with that is to say that you had pointed out that there's a lot of well-meaning, good-intentioned people uh, who come up with programs like uh, income redistribution, uh, uh, minimum wage, mm -hmm. and my question is how much of it, it really is um, good intentions versus people who believe in punishing the United States, we've been too prosperous, in other words, actually intent on damaging the United States versus good intentions? That's a really good question. Um, I, 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 tend, I tend to be very, very skeptical of conspiracy theories. Um, you know, like, like, I, like, I told, like I told my students, the first day of class, I said, okay, so Affordable Care Act, um, all of a sudden the magic number for small businesses is 49 employees. Okay, 
Why is that? Because once you hit 50, your costs go up dramatically as a result of ACA provisions. I said, did Barack Obama sit down and say, you know what, I really, I really want to screw up the American labor market before he signed the piece of legislation? One of my students said, okay, yeah, probably he did. Okay, and I, it's, it's, it's possible, not probable, necessarily. I, I, th I, th I think most, most bad policy ideas are driven by people who have, who, who, who have very, very soft hearts, but unfortunately, very, very soft heads as a result of the fact that they, it, that, 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 they, that they do not know the consequences of the policies that, 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 that they're engaging in. Um, a friend of mine named Justin Ross is an economist at Indiana University. He gives a, he gives a, or gave a talk to incoming graduate students in the policy school at Indiana. I think the title of the talk was something like, Why You Need to Know, an, Why you need to know Economics, a brief, introduction, a brief Introduction to How Not to Kill People. So as I tell my students, it's, it's really not very hard to go from you don't understand international trade to body count. Okay, so we have to be very, again, we have to, we have to be very, very careful. I, 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 think though, I think though that most of it's driven by, um, by people who are very, very well intentioned but who don't understand the consequences of the policies they're espousing. Two, two quick questions. Yep. Um, your take on economic development incentives, I take it you don't like the government interfering and, right. and that would be viewed as that. And are you more in favor of a flat tax or the fair tax? Um, okay, so, uh, so econo economic development incentives. In general, um, I, th I, think, I, think they're, I think they're a bad idea because of the incentives that they create. Um, one, th one, thing I, one thing I've been thinking about a lot, though, is, is the extent to which local governments might act as, as, as almost price discriminating monopolists in a sense where they can charge different tax rates to different people based on competition for their services. There's a small case perhaps to be made for economic development incentives, but I think it, it, it gets us into a world of trying to pick winners that governments have shown themselves to be very, 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 very bad at. Um, see, flat, ta flat tax versus fair tax, that's a good question. Um, I kind of, in, in, my, in, my, in my perfect world, if, uh, if, if we have to have a government, if we have to have a tax system, um, something like just a, just a, a straight head tax, I think, would, would be good. Where you said something like, okay, your fee for being an American is $1,000 this year, because that's, that's going to be as, that's, that's, that's going to be, going to be minimally, minimally distortionary. Um, I can't really, I, I, I can't, I can't really, I can't really decide. Flat, flat tax versus fair tax. Um, in both cases, much better than what we have right now. That is absolutely for certain. Appreciate your remarks, sir. You were talking about the difference between the free market operating versus government controlling things, and obviously one producing better results than the other. Um, we see this, for example, in education. It's a government monopoly. How do we use this information to affect public policy and make the right changes? Oh, that is a fantastic question. And actually, it was something I was thinking about a minute ago. Um, the economist Brian Kaplan has suggested finding things governments do poorly and making ways to compete with them. So for example, when I, when I, was, I, was, I was looking to grab a pen out of, my, out of my bag a minute ago, I had my, my National Christian Forensics and Communication Association pen from a tournament that I judged uh, a few weeks ago. On the ground, education is something governments are really, really terrible at. I mean, that's, that's unambiguously, governments are terrible at education. Um, there's a multi-pronged strategy. One is, is convince people of the benefits of educational choice. Which I think are which I think are unambiguous in the literature. The the economics literature is clear on the benefits of educational choice. And then in terms of things we can do from day to day, NCFCA is an excellent competitor to government to government educational monopolies. So by doing something like offering a couple of hours of your time to help judge a debate tournament, which will be one of the most fun things you'll ever do in your life, um, is is I think is I think a way to help create organizations that compete with the state in areas where the state does very, 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 very poorly. In terms of actually advancing the ideas and things, and, and things like that, look at the letters to the editor section of your local newspaper and consider the quality of the arguments in, the, in those letters, letters to the editor. What you can do is write a better letter to the editor and improve the quality of public discourse and really help people to see some of the benefit and the value of these ideas. Thank you.
you. Uh, stay up here for, for a second, if you would. We really appreciate it. What, a, what an interesting uh, presentation, extraordinarily articulate. Thank you for making the trip uh, as a token of our appreciation. Let me present to you something which I'm sure uh, you'll be uh, pleased to wear, and that is one of the Leadership Institute's Adam Smith ties. Oh. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will tell a, a, a little anecdote that is apropos. You mentioned the fact that a license is required to arrange flowers in Louisiana. Uh, Helen and I grew up in, in Baton Rouge, and one of the people that we started working with when he was in high school was a guy named uh, Woody Jenkins, who uh, got elected to the legislature. I believe he served 28 years in the legislature. And uh, uh, he was uh, very much uh, in, in economics uh, a libertarian. And they, 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 were, they had been proposing over th some years new licensure uh, for different types of activity. And a bill came up They'd already, of course, licensed barbers and uh, beauticians, but a bill came up to now license shampoo girls, a as if there were some governmental need to license shampoo girls. And Woody, who could do a good intellectual argument, also uh, understood uh, how to, to, to make a case. And he came up with a, uh, a substitute motion to license shoeshine boys <laughs> across Louisiana. And uh, there are probably a number of people in this room who at some point or another uh, went out on the sidewalk and offered to do shoe shines. And so uh, he, he suggested this could be done. And he began to make these uh, passionate arguments in behalf of his bill. He said, first off, we have to recognize that we have to keep a high standard, uh, and, uh, and if we don't do that, then there will be um, bad shoe shines, and, uh, and the public will not be well served by these bad shoe shines, he said. And, uh, and besides, uh, there is the need to protect Louisiana against the out-of-state shoe shine interests, which will, which will <laughs> which will come in here and, and take the, the labor away. And we also have to consider the very important aspect of child labor. Uh, the shoeshine boys might not be of the, of the right age. And, and he got the fellow members of the legislature roaring with laughter with his reductio of all of these uh, uh, reasons for that. And the shampoo license bill, shampoo girl license bill was uh, uh, put down, and it was years before they came up with uh, another bill to, to license a new uh, kind of activity. I, I want to uh, uh, invite uh, you to join us on March 6th for our next Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. Uh, we offer for any who are interested immediately at the adjournment of the breakfast a tour of the Leadership Institute and our annex next door. Uh, Heather Sherlock, where are you? Here's Heather. Heather uh, is uh, one of our donor relations officers, and she will be happy to answer uh, any questions uh, that you may have. And so she'll take you on a tour from stem to stern. Thank you for coming.